Today's episode of Transform Your Workplace is brought to you by Zenium HR. The demands of HR and payroll are endless, and that's why Zenium provides a complete solution for both so that you can focus on what you do best, which is growing your organization. Learn more about Zenium at zeniumhr.com. All right, I brought on Tatiana Cure today for this episode. We had a great discussion around attracting and retaining talent. She is an expert in recruiting and hiring. And so we're discussing how to hire to win. It's basically a manager's practical guide for attracting and interviewing top talent. So you're going to hear a lot about best practices for writing job descriptions, interviewing candidates, selecting the right hire, all while cutting out the tedious and time-consuming methods that we've all grown accustomed to throughout the recruiting and hiring process. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Reach out to me on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram. I love connecting with listeners in all of those places. Have a great week, and we'll talk to you next week. we got a lot of great material coming, so make sure to subscribe if you haven't subscribed yet, and enjoy all the upcoming episodes. Take care. Tatiana, it is such a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited, Brendan. We are going to dive into your book. It's called Hire to Win, Manager's Practical Guide for Attracting and Interviewing Top Talent. You know, when I do intros to the show um, and, and talk to a guest, I usually don't talk about background of, of the person a whole lot because I just want to get into the interview. But I think with this topic of recruiting and hiring and, and how complex it can be and how well so many people do it wrong. I do want to hear your background because if people are going to listen to you today and say like, oh, here's my guide to hiring and recruiting, I think it makes sense for you to tell your story a little bit about where where you come from and, and how you ended up writing a book about best practices around hiring. So if you if you don't mind sharing a little bit about your history and how you, how you got to where you are, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. So I, I totally agree with, you know, I think at this phase, I think I need to kind of gain some credit and so right. like, hey, here's this chickadee who wrote this book, go pick it up. <laughs> you know, no. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I uh, actually fell into recruiting. It's not something that I like woke up one day and was like, I'm going to go to college for recruiting. I'm going to be the best recruiter ever. Uh, that's not how it happened. I totally fell into it. And the way I did was I happened to be pretty good in sales. So it was, uh, I had a background in sales. And then a friend of mine went into a a staffing firm and it was a small staffing firm and that president was looking to expand and she's like look like I don't know any recruiters but I know this person who's really good at sales so why don't you go talk to her and so there I was like trying to interview for this job that I didn't know like I didn't know that a recruiter was actually a job so <laughs> <laughs> like I I don't even remember how, like what kind of questions were asked or how I answered but uh, at the end I did get the job but I'm my first day, I was given a phone and a computer and they're like, Hey, okay. So you're a recruiter now go, go recruit. I'm like, Oh, okay. you're like, well, what, do I, what do I do? <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. And it was, and by the way, this was compliance and legal for financial services. Okay. So it was like Dodd-Frank, Volcker rule, Chinese wall. Oh, like, I'm like, what? <laughs> and you probably don't, don't even know that space. Well, right. <laughs> <laughs> no way. So, but it was great. You know, I figured it out and I actually uh, became a pretty, you know, top producer at that firm. I surpassed the billings of the president. Yeah. So wow. uh, it was really cool. And then I went into creative financial staffing, which is a another search firm, but they were focusing on accounting and finance. And we ser serviced, you know, every sort of industry. So it was anywhere from like restaurants to manufacturing to tech companies 
companies to financial services and so forth. And so I did that for quite some time. And what really attracted me there, by the way, was that office. So they, that company had 50 plus offices across the country, but the office in New York, which is where I was at the time, wasn't doing that high. And they were actually looking to close that office. And I'm like, great, I love a challenge. Let me, let me see what I can do. And, you know, lo and behold, you know, my third quarter with the company, I won the incentive trip and like, you know, became like a top recruiter and so forth. Um, and then I got recruited to Bank Liumi. And this organization has been in US for 65 years. And I was the first recruiter. So I, at first I was like, how does that even happen? Right. <laughs> so that's, a, that's like a whole other story that we'll save for another day. But I had to, and I joined at the time of like transformational growth and, you know, just hyper growth and transformational change. And, you know, we had, you know, 50 plus openings across the country. And at the same oh time, my and you're just one recruiter. Oh, yeah. Doing all that. Oh, my goodness. And by the way, the entire process, right? Like not just like sourcing and, and interviewing, right. but also doing like background checks and drug testing oh. and fingerprinting and onboarding and all of that. <laughs> Um, so I was definitely stretched and challenged, but I think what really put like all of that to a test was when I became a hiring manager myself. And so I kind of start out in my book of like, let me tell you about all these mistakes I have made. And the reason why I did that, like one, I want to make sure that, you know, I'm a human and I'm not perfect, but also it's like this thing about even as a recruiter who lives and breathes hiring, like I made mistakes. Like it's really when you're in the eye of the storm and I know better, but it was just hard for me to pull myself out and offer myself this advice when I became a hiring manager. And so I was like, look, like here are all these mistakes that I've made and here's what I learned from it. And like, I tell you these mistakes because I'm certain that you will at least repeat one of them. Right. <laughs> so yeah. Let's, let's talk about that in the open. <laughs> Can you share a couple of those mistakes with listeners? Yeah. So the kind of the first mistake that I shared was like, I took it personally, right? So, and I think that everyone goes through that, like the number one advice that you're given when you're entering a professional work is, you know, don't send an angry email, right? Like write it out, you know, go to sleep. If you wake up and you feel the same way the next day, then go ahead and send it. But like, most likely you're not going to send it. Right. Mm -hmm. So like I took things so personally and I acted with emotion and so forth. And I think that everyone can relate to it, especially those managers who are looking to get approval for additional headcount for the right. first time because they're exceeding every goal and it gets turned down. So they're like, you know what? I'm going to go somewhere else, right? Well, wait a second. Let's look at that. Like, did you position your case in the right way? Did you use the right statistics to make your case? And are you willing to think outside of the box and maybe like start with a temp or something like that, right? It's not something that needs to be perfect right out of the gate. So that, that's one of the mistakes that I kind of talk about. What are some of the costs associated with making hiring mistakes overall? And then I don't know if you made those yourselves, but you know, in, in talking with hiring managers and they, let's say they make a big hiring mistake, the wrong person, the wrong fit. What, what are some of the costs associated with that? Mental health. <laughs> <laughs> No, but seriously, I mean, we, there's so many um, statistics out there in terms of like the cost of a bad hire and the right. morale that it takes on your team, the dip that it takes, the productivity and so forth. But as a manager who is doing this hiring, there's no mistake of thinking about like, you know, it's on me. I made that decision. Like I need to own it. So what ends up happening, right? Say so take you know, a little bit longer to let that person go if that is a bad hire, then, right, you yeah. know, and so forth. So all of that toll that it takes, and it doesn't, especially in nowadays, like where your work and life is meshed together, you can't just leave your work at work and then come home and be at home. Like, no, it's all part of this. It's, you're talking about it at a dinner table. You're, you know? <laughs> so yeah, the biggest cost I think is mental health and your own productivity. Yeah, and it also seems like if it's a bad hire, that you don't let go immediately, like you realize it's a bad hire and you actually just keep that person on, it damages the culture and the team dynamic, I think, greatly. And that's a huge cost in my mind is just impacting the overall team and team dynamic. Right. And imagine if, you know, the other team players see 
that the manager is, you know, allowing this person to be mediocre or worse. And they're like, well, why am I carrying this load? Yeah, like, <laughs> you know, and then either they leave or worse, they stay and the bar of performance just gets lower yeah. and lower. And what's interesting in this current environment with, you know, whatever you want to call it, the great resignation, the great reshuffle, I've heard a thousand different words, it seems like, but people are not going to tolerate that. Like, hanging on to bad performers and then, oh, I'm going to work harder to carry the weight of other people who aren't holding their weight. People are just going to leave, don't you think? Oh, yes, totally. To your point, like a great reshuffle, I haven't heard, but I like that a lot. (laughs) Well, because like the great resignation implies, I think that it's like people are just leaving the workforce altogether. The reshuffle is like, I hate this culture. I'm going to go make more money elsewhere. So I'm going to, I'm going to leave and then go work. So the reshuffling, it's like the talent's still there. It's just people are moving around. <laughs> yeah, no, I like that a lot. I often uh, talk about it as like great reassessment where yeah, the person's yeah. like, you know what, let me reassess what's important <laughs> in my life and like what I'm willing to put up with and not put up with. I love that. Yeah, it's so good. When it comes to hiring, so with hiring managers, do they, in your experience, rush through the process of hiring or are they thoughtful about it? And that's just kind of an overarching, like in your experience, like, do they take it seriously or is it is it a rushed process because they just need a warm body to do the work? Well, it's a little bit of both. I've seen it actually <laughs> both ways where they take, you know, they rush through it or they are acting so slowly <laughs> that they lose their candidates. But to your point, I think that when they're so much under stress of getting things done and they need that body, for sure they rush through it. And by the way, it starts from all the way in the beginning beginning, right? When creating a job description, right? What I have seen those managers who try to rush through it do is borrow another job description from another company. And I use the word oh, borrow no. like very loosely, right? Copy and paste. <laughs> Copy and paste. Exactly. <laughs> and so what ends up happening is that, you know, first of all, like that job description is not really like that descriptive. So you're going to, you know, perhaps attract a high number of candidates, but they don't even know what they're really applying to. So then you're investing a whole lot of time of going through of like explaining the role and what that role actually is. And then those candidates are like, you know, if I knew I wouldn't have applied to begin with, number one. And then number two, when they interview, it doesn't matter how many interviews there are. It could be one interview, it could be 10, but some of those interviews are the same exact interview just happening 10 times, right? So tell me about yourself, walk me through your resume, like what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? Let me tell you how awesome we are. So you're just scratching the surface on both sides, right? Like the candidate is going to put their best sales hat on and try to sell their background. You're as a hiring manager going to put your sales hat on to sell the company because you need a warm body. But you never truly like took the time to say like, what is it that I actually need for my team? What is the skill gap? How much training am I willing to do? Like, what's the career path for that person? And then what ends up happening when those questions come up from the candidate, like, okay, well, how, you know, how can I potentially grow my career? Like, my biggest pet peeve is when the manager says, well, I'm looking for someone to take my job. If that doesn't happen, what? They're, but they're the manager, <laughs> right? Well, like also you're setting like unrealistic expectations of like, right. you know, so you're hiring someone to take your job. So in a couple of years, if that doesn't happen and that person's like, well, I still really want to grow my career, yeah. you know? So you just never took that time to really understand what's the mutual fit, not just short term because you need a warm body. But a long term and long term nowadays is 12 months, you know, (laughs) so true. Let's let's go back to something you said a little bit ago, and it was in related to that position you took where it's like you had like 50 open positions. And I can't believe you were doing all that on your own, honestly. Um, And there comes a time where you're probably going to have to ask for help. So your first hire, right? You're in charge of this entire recruiting department uh, and you're it. But at some point, you're probably going to want to make the ask to the higher ups, you know, somebody on the exec team or your direct boss, like, I need help. I need to hire somebody. How do you make that case without backfiring on you? 
Right. So, you know, there, there's no one right answer. I will say like, yes, I, in my book, like I talk about like making a business case and, you know, using some statistics, like here's what I was able to do on my own. Here's what I could potentially do with someone else. And in my case, right. As a recruiter, when I first joined, my priorities were like, fill these jobs as quickly as you can without using, you know, a huge number of external recruiters and paying huge fees. But once that fit Phase, once like the initial, you know, kind of stage phase of like, okay, there's no longer 50 open roles. And now we're able to assess to see like, okay, well, do we actually do great hiring? Did that person actually onboard, you know, correctly, and we're able to get up to speed correctly? Did we miss anything on their background checks, whatever the case may be? Like once you're able to assess that, then you can make the case what kind of person you need, not only that you need another headcount, but do you need another recruiter? Do you need like an analyst? Do you need a sourcer? Do you need like what are you, a scheduler? Like who do you need exactly? So for me, it was a little bit easier because it was very clear in terms of numbers, like how many people we were hiring last year compared to this year and how quickly we were because we were tracking all of that information. But sometimes it's not as easy to gauge that, right? Like sometimes, you're like, I'm just doing whatever my to-do list is, but you can absolutely say like, this is what I'm able to do now. This is the impact that it has on the, the client service I'm providing, the attention that this person is getting, um, you know, what, what have you. So you're able to pull all of that information uh, in there. But then there's other things that you need to, to consider, right? So like what else is happening in the company? How many other managers are coming to the CEO asking for a headcount? What else is happening in the world, right? Like, is there like, what's the economic situation? What's the stress level? Like, is it, you know, is there, is everyone on edge because, you know, these holidays are coming up and they're thinking about their families and you're coming in there with like an ass and they're like, seriously, like I'm about to snap on you. <laughs> there's no like, here's, the, the perfect, you know, black and white path, you need to know how this is handled in your organization and see where others have had success. But you will always need to provide some sort of data, you will right. always need to provide some sort of like clear case, but you need to consider like emotions and so forth as well. So, yeah, absolutely. You know, one thing that's coming up for me in terms of just the data part of it is, you know, it feels like compensation's a little nuts right now. Like it just seems like everybody's getting paid. Like yeah, that's why people are probably leaving is like, they're able to just go get more money elsewhere. And it's a little overwhelming. So if you're trying to make a case for getting a new hire, maybe it's a position you've never had before. Is there a step that you would take personally in terms of like capturing that data about what it's going to cost? Yeah. So you need to do your own research and expectation that you do that. And by the way, that's not just external research, but also internal, right? right. It's so easy to just throw bodies at a problem and say like, let's yeah. just hire more people. Right. But wait a second, like are our processes like as efficient as they could be? Like, does it really require another person or do you just need to like challenge a way that you do things in a different way, a more effective way? So you need to do the internal homework, but then you need to do external homework. And it's so easy to say, well, you know, the market data shows, and by the way, like I actually did a search for talent acquisition professional just out of curiosity and on some of those sites, like, you know, salary.com or whatever the case may Glass be, right? Glassdoor. Glassdoor, whatever. Yeah. So, and, and some of them are really good about, okay, we'll add, you know, other factors like education and geography and so forth, but it's still just for a talent acquisition professional. It still gave me almost a hundred thousand dollar difference of like what? what the salary could be. <laughs> right. But it, if you actually sit down and think about it, it makes perfect sense because if you think about a talent acquisition person at, you know, a startup compared to a talent acquisition professional at a global organization, right, yeah. You know, yes, the title is the same and yes, you know, the responsibilities are the same, but the volume and the work and the complexity and the laws and regulations that you need to be on top of and, you know, the systems that you need to be familiar with and so forth could change. And so that makes total sense. So you need to start comparing apples to apples as well, in addition to like knowing the market and knowing what else is out there, but also understanding like 
what pond are we swimming in here? That's like, a good point. So let's say um, you get approval. You're going to make that that first hire. What what are some of the steps that you would take in terms of like getting that job description going? And there's probably a million other steps, but like what what kind of first steps would you take once you get approval? Right. So again, like what most people do at that stage, like, great, let me like Google and like borrow other companies. And I'm like, oh my gosh, no, like let's really sit down and think about what you need, what you need for your team and the role, right? And the best way I kind of talk about it, uh, the analogy that I use pretty frequently is like when you go to Ikea and buy, you know, a piece of furniture, there's directions right on top of that box. But I got to tell you, I've never known anyone who actually reads those directions. They're like, I'll figure out how to put this table together. <laughs> you're you're <laughs> speaking to me. You're speaking to a guy who hates reading instructions and I hate building Ikea furniture. <laughs> right. And so, but, but you buy it and you still put it together. And then at the end, you're like, oops, like I have this extra leg for this table. <laughs> Where exactly do I put right. it? <laughs> oh, it's okay. Like, let me just put it on the side. I feel like you know me. <laughs> <laughs> reading your soul. Um, but yeah. So I, it's the same thing in hiring, right? Like it's too easy to be like, yeah. okay, let me just go borrow these job descriptions. But if you don't actually do the initial work yourself, and, and that's like what I call recruiting intake, it's pretty common, you know, in the industry to have some sort of recruiting intake. Sometimes it's faster. Like maybe it's just a quick conversation. Like, what are you looking for? And when I used to do that verbally uh, without like a format of things that I want to know, usually a manager would say, well, you know, I'm looking for someone who's like super organized and has great communication skills and, you know, is able to build great relationships and has an MBA and has 10 years experience in the, in the field and knows this product. Look, whoa, (laughs) let's let's like, let's take a step back and see like, what is the actual challenge that you're looking to solve? Let's look at, you know, what is the career progression may look like? What's the hook for this person? Why would someone want this job? What, what does the day-to-day look like? So that that way, once you start answering those questions, you won't need to go borrow someone else's job. In fact, it will write that job description for you. And in my book, I essentially like created like, okay, this is a recruiting intake. And if you use these questions, here's how you can transfer the information from the recruiting intake to a job description without looking at anyone else's job description. Now, I still think you should look and see what, what's out there just so you know the market market, but I highly discourage you to just copy and paste from another job description because what that looks like at that organization may be completely different what it looks like here. And when you're saying job description, you're meaning like that internal document that, you know, somebody you're hiring somebody that's like, here's what your role is. Like basically the, the one that you're kind of measuring their performance off of versus like, a job posting, which is in my mind, like the more the marketing, like the one that you're going to promote out there. Or am I thinking about them as separate, but they're really the one and the same, like maybe just shed light on that. They're actually one of the same, okay. right? So even in the recruiting intake, which I say is a, you know, internal document, like you're not going to post it. So like, right. write as however you want to write, but your job description is going to be the job description that you market, you're going to use, right? But in the intake, one of the questions that you should be thinking about is what are you hoping for this new hire to accomplish in three months, six months? 12 months, right? And you should talk about that in an interview. In fact, most candidates will ask questions. How is success measured in this role? How, I love that. you know, how do I grow my career? And so instead of you saying, okay, I'm just looking for someone to take my job at some point. Now you actually have an opportunity to talk about, look, like if you're able to accomplish, you know, these things in 12 months, Let's talk about what would be your next professional or personal goal that I can help you with. Maybe we look for next stretch assignments. Maybe I introduce you to someone in my network, whatever the case may be for, for that person. But at least you're talking about specifics rather than very broadly. Yeah. And candidates, what we have found and when we started to put those success measures within three, six, 12 months into job descriptions, we had less applicants, but the applicants who applied were actually spot on right and they came prepared and yeah. they, you know, came with like a portfolio of like ready to talk about their background and how they would accomplish those things. Yeah. I was going to ask you a bunch of questions about the job descriptions because I, I see them 
being so boring and, and lame and they're hard to stand out. And something I did personally, and you could tell me if this is a good idea or not, it, it ended up working out. But um, I was opening a position back in, I think, February of last year, so almost a year ago. And I was I have a marketing position basically being opened. And I'm like, I've got to do something creative because what's not going to cut it is a boring job description with a list of duties, right? So I actually hopped on a video with another colleague of mine recorded it describing what the culture is like, what this position, how it fits in the organization, what we expect, basically tried to make a vivid story for what this job is going to be. And then we actually embedded that video within the job posting, a job description that we we publicly um, shared on, on the web. And, you know, the person I ended up hiring, which she's amazing, she, I think she said something about that video was like one of the main drivers and why she decided to apply. I was thinking like, like, wow, maybe I'm on to something and others are probably doing some really creative things too. But how do how do you enhance job descriptions? They're so boring the way people do them. Have you seen anything, you know, similar to what I did or anything else that stands out in your mind about how to just really attract the, the right fit people? No, I, I love that so much. And I think that what's important to remember is that there's a pot for every lid. So your video may have attracted the person who you needed yeah. and detracted those individuals who are like, that's not for me. Like I wouldn't have done that. Well, then you're better. You're both better off for it. Right. And so I wish, I wish more companies did that and they don't, but to the point of, you know, and, and by the way, like not every company is going to be as creative as you for a variety of reasons. Maybe there's regulation challenges. Maybe there's like other restraints that they may have, but you can absolutely take the boring out of a job description simply by putting back some human aspect to it, right? And it's more about like, okay, maybe I don't list the 20 bullet points of like, you need to be a good communicator. Well, duh, like, <laughs> I don't know any jobs at this point. They're like, you know what? You don't need to talk to anyone. You don't need to. <laughs> Advanced user of PowerPoint. Like, really? <laughs> Yeah, like I always ask managers, like when they start putting like different bullet points are like being organized or whatever. I'm like, like, do you, do you feel that it's, you know, that descriptive that we need to include that? And a lot of times they're like, well, no, I just want to make sure, right? Well, you, you can take the boring out. So if you are saying it's important in this job to communicate well, okay, so in the first three months, maybe the sign of success is that you need to build great relationships with the stakeholders and, you know, start talking about the roadmap for the next year. Okay, at least that's specific in terms of how you think about communication. And again, like you can absolutely, you know, add some additional color to the role or the organization by talking about not, I, I've seen some companies that would list out their mission, their company mission. And a lot of times it's such corporate jargon and it means nothing to anyone. They're like, okay, another company looking to save the world, right? But if you actually say like, look, this is how we live our values. And one of our values is, I'm making this up, like passion. Okay, so here's how it actually shows up in our organization. Person X did this. This team did that. This is what we do outside of work to feed our passions. That's something that's really interesting to someone. And they are more likely to read it, get excited about it, follow up on it. You know, as a candidate, you can absolutely think of different ways outside of creating this awesome video that you did. Well, look at us. We're at 30 minutes almost and haven't even got to interviewing yet. Uh, (laughs) All jokes aside. So there's so many like other nuggets uh, that I'm sure we could touch on on that part. But I I do want to get to like when you start getting applicants and, and you're sorting through resumes, how do you manage that entire workflow? That can be so daunting and, and probably depends on the type of position and how many applications and resumes you got to look through. But how do you streamline some of that without, I don't know, relying too much on technology where you're like ignoring good candidates or there might be bias involved? I mean, this is a kind of a huge area that I, I just don't know a lot about. You know, what advice do you give people about just just how to prioritize resumes and applications and how to go through them. Yeah, that that's uh, such a great question. And there's so many 
you know, pieces to it. But I think the number one thing that we can absolutely do very quickly is prioritize the time to do it, right? Where most people, you know, I ask candidates, you know, what is the most common time that they apply to jobs? And they say while they're commuting, this was at a time while they were commuting, right? But they say like between meetings, you know, some person said like while on the toilet, you know, <laughs> um, and managers do the same thing. They will look through resumes between meetings or during the time that they are actually at a meeting and they are just not speaking. So they're just like multitasking. So when you do that, then you're just focusing on the keywords and you're like very quickly making judgment calls, right? So that could work potentially, but what I have seen is that that's like almost like the chance of flipping a coin and saying like, yep, heads, I got pretty good talent here. But there's another opportunity of like blocking the time for, let's say, an hour to look through resumes and actually kind of think about what is that person bringing to the table? Because it's so hard to summarize our entire background on one piece of paper, right, to try to put it on a resume. So you try to to think about, okay, like I try to have a system a little bit of instead of making a judgment call based on their like location and name and other biases, I try to think about prioritizing them as to like what kind of candidate are they? Is it a stretch person who is looking for their next role up in their career? Is it a role player who is potentially just reassessing what's important to them and maybe remote work is more important to them so they're okay with doing the same exact job but in a different organization? Those resumes are going to be more like spot on if you just do like control F and try to do, you know, some word searches, they probably have the most words on their resume that you have in the job description. And then there's game changers who may have that entrepreneurial mindset that you're looking for, or have a background in a field that you're hoping to get into at some point. So essentially, if you hire that person, it would literally change the course of your business. So game changers, right? And then there's like those blanket resumes who like just apply to like every job. They don't even know what position they apply yeah, for. <laughs> that's right. But like, let's stick to these three categories, right? And then you try to categorize. Okay, so if game changers are going to literally change the course of my organization, I have to prioritize talking to as many as, as I could for those. For role players, those are the the ones that most hiring managers are looking for because they're like, they're spot on, like they're going to have the least amount of training possible. But keep in mind, those role players are probably going to have other job offers. They're going to be very competitive and getting counter offers somewhere else. And they're going to be looking for kind of an opportunity to improve their situations in some sort of way. And if it doesn't, then they're going to look for another opportunity. That's just the nature of being a role player. And so then a stretch assignment uh, individual. Those are the individuals who feel that they want to prove themselves. So they're going to work harder. They tend to want to stay a little bit longer, especially if they're being recognized and promoted and trained and so forth. So once you look at all of those three areas, then you start thinking about, well, how much training time am I able to have at this point? If it's very little, maybe stretch assignment candidates are not the right fit for you. You know, you kind of prioritize your your time that way of knowing exactly what you're able to give back to the candidate, if that makes any sense. Yeah. What, uh, if any, technology or software tools do you use throughout the process of sorting and prioritizing applications and resumes? And, and even, you know, when you start deciding on candidates to interview, is there a system that you you recommend, like an applicant tracking system that makes a lot of sense or, or ones that are, you know, stand above the others? I mean, I'm a big fan of Greenhouse, but I think that all sorts of applicant tracking systems kind of do what you need to do. But when I first joined Liumi uh, as a first recruiter, we didn't have an applicant tracking system. So I used Excel <laughs> and in my book and, and on my website, like I say, like, look, like if you don't have an applicant tracking system, use Excel. You know, here here's the template that I have, like just download it and use it. I've used Trello as well. Oh, right. um, yeah, I like Trello. It's pro- more of a project management. 
management tool, but it, yeah, I'm, I could see how it serves get, the purpose. Right. right? Yeah. <laughs> so whatever makes sense, but I would say, you know, make it so it's less of a chore for you. So some people, some managers or some recruiters, they're like, look, like I don't have time to, you know, fill this information out into an applicant tracking system. Okay. Well, I remind them like, look, like I had a lot of experiences where like two years later, I remember talking to this individual who was perfect. And I remember everything about them other than their name. So if I don't know their name, I can't find their contact information. So do what's right for you and, and make it less of a chore and make it more systematic. So, you know, if for, for those game changers, like put it on your calendar to reach out to them every quarter or something like that. But there, there's definitely systems out there that can help. That's good. Uh, speaking of systemization, when you start interviewing people, it feels like the communication process is so like just tactical and tedious because you're, you know, scheduling the the interview itself, whether it's in person or virtual, and then just so much back and forth of communication. Is there any ways that you've streamlined that process and made it a good experience for both parties? Yeah, so I have created kind of communication templates for candidates. So if it's more about like, I know for all the individuals who I will invite in to interview with me, they have to get an invitation to interview with me, right? So I can write out a template and I try to like make it less template-y by saying, okay, here are some articles on how to how to interview well. Here are some articles. Here's a technique of how to subside your interview jitters. So I try to make it less template-y of like, you know, here's your location and the time. Like, yeah, you need to put that information in there, but every candidate deserves to feel that they are just as important as they make the company being. But you can very much like create one of that template so you're not rewriting it time and time again. And of course, if you have an applicant tracking system, you can put it in there and, and write it out. But for me, again, in the beginning, I didn't have an applicant tracking system. So I just saved all of those templates as a signature on my email. So it was an alternative signature. So it, it was just so easy for me. I didn't have to go through like Word and copy and paste. Like it was already there. So I created my own way of communicating with them. Yeah, I love that. When you start interviewing people, is there a way in which you're tracking the performance of the interviews and how each candidate digs? You know, if you're not taking notes and you're not reflecting on on how people are doing and, and, and all that, I, I feel like there's a lot of recency bias with people interviewing. It's like either the first person or the last person. <laughs> it's like it's just the recency bias kind of takes over unless you have a way of kind of formalizing the performances of each interview. So how do you organize that. Right. And by the way, it's not just recency bias, but also the individuals who you felt like you connected with. Them right. Most. Yeah. Like I'll go get a beer with them. They're like, be a friend. And then, and then obviously that's, I'm going to have a bias towards like, I'm going to have a good relationship with this person <laughs> versus like, right. you're going to kick ass on the job. <laughs> Right. And so I go back to that directions of, you know, building your furniture, right? So when you look to see like, these are the competencies that are must have for me for this role, this is what I need you to have in this, uh, in this role. So then develop those questions ahead of time. So that way you're not swayed by like, oh, we travel to the same places. And then, you know, spend 30 minutes talking about those places rather than talking about, you know, I need to understand your Excel skills. I need to understand, you know, your project project management skills and so forth. And having the same questions, right? So it's very easy to get swayed in an interview and all of a sudden you never really asked about their Excel skills, but you just have a feeling that they have those Excel skills. So when you start comparing two or three candidates and you're like, well, this person had, I think they have Excel skills. This person talked about Excel skills. So you can't compare apples to apples in, in that way. So ask the same questions, right? And then, you know, kind of one step further that I will say is, you know, I've had some hiring managers who will say like, it's really important to have Excel in this role. Do you have Excel skills? Why, well, yes, I do. You just told me that I must, right? So like, don't give your answer away in the questions that you're asking the candidate and actually understand what they're coming from, right? In, the, in their background. When you have a, a couple of candidates to compare, then you start having to make decisions on what's most important to you, right? Or like where, where you're willing to compromise. So they may have better technical skills. They might have better, you know, interpersonal skills. They may have the motivations that more 
more aligned with what you're able to give them, you have to give and take. And so you can't do that until you actually compare side by side and, and evaluate. Where in the process are hiring managers talking about compensation? And this is pre-offer. So is it coming up beforehand? Is it on the job description? I don't know if you're a proponent of that or, or not. I think there's a lot of recruiters and HR professionals out there that are like, employers are insane for not putting at least a range on the job description. But I'm curious where this all comes up, conversation. And so in my book, I talk about it's like this elephant in the room <laughs> that like no one wants to poke, <laughs> right? But it's like, it's important, right? Yeah. So yes, I, I'm a big supporter of listing the compensation range in the job description because then you're not wasting anyone's time. Right. You're not wasting your time. You know, you're, you're, you're just moving forward. So I say to bring it up early and bring it up often. I actually talk about, you know, bring it up at every single conversation because the more the candidate learns about what's the expectation of the role and the full package. Mm-hmm. And it's also, I find it super unfair when companies require candidates to list out their salary expectations. Yeah, that's a no-no. Without knowing any thing about yeah. it, right? Without knowing the package, without knowing, you know, are you asking me about my base salary? Are, are you asking me all in? Like, what, what are my, what are my tools here to, to make yeah. that decision? I'll never forget. So years ago, my mom is in software sales. She has been for, I don't know, 30 years or whatever. And I, I think she was looking to, to change companies. And she went down the road of, I think, three interviews. And it was like, getting down to selection time, they hadn't talked about compensation at all. It wasn't on the job description. And I remember they came to her with an offer and (laughs) she (laughs) almost spit out her coffee or whatever the equivalent of that would be. It was like so far off and she's not one to like want to bring it up and they never brought it up. So it was just this awkward, oh, wow, we just wasted everybody's time here because it was totally misaligned. So that's the one thing I always tell employers and people I talk to, at least put a range on the job description, please. <laughs> right. Well, well, and here's the thing, like I talk about, like no one wants to poke this elephant, but the person who does actually controls the conversation about it. So like what you just talked about with your mom, right? Like because no one brought it up until the very end and the person who ended up bringing it up was the company, they controlled the conversation. They controlled the entire or lack of conversation around it, right? But if a candidate, I actually encourage candidates when it comes to time to, you know, where the interviewer finally gives you the last two minutes of the interview to ask questions, like that should be one of your questions if it wasn't brought up in any way. Like, hey, I'm curious while I'm looking at the role and the description and I'm so excited by it, but, you know, I'm also curious about what the compensation is. Could you tell me a little bit about how you think about compensation? And you don't have to ask about like, hey, like here's my salary expectations. Can you meet them? Like you don't have to go down that way. You still can word it in a way where you basically put it in their court. I actually I like that approach for for a candidate to just like see what see what their feelings are and, and let let them address it. And the thing is, like, we're taught as humans, like, never to answer a question with another question. So whoever brings it up, right, like, what's the comp for this role? The other person should not turn around and say, well, what's the comp expectations for you? Like, now you're just asking Mm -hmm. a question with a question. So again, like, whoever brings it up first has the advantage of controlling the dialogue around it. Uh, That's a great point. Yeah. I want to hit up a couple more things. And I've kept you so long. And I'm having so much fun. So I'm, I'm glad you've hung on with me for this long. Um, when it comes time to make the offer, what are some do's and don'ts in, in your mind? Uh, and maybe whatever process that you've had success with, maybe share that with listeners. Well, don't do what your mom's company did. <laughs> I'm just like extending an offer and just like split, spitting coffee, yeah. you know, like shock. So you want to be able to to build up the conversation around it so there's no huge surprise. Yeah, that's good. So I actually, like as recruiters, as external recruiters, every recruiter is taught this to do a soft close uh, before you actually extend an offer of like, hey, so we're making the final decision here. I just kind of want to, you know, run some numbers by you, see how you're feeling about it. The paper is not in front of them yet. So there's still this opportunity to negotiate. And I personally hate, hate, hate this advice that's given to candidates 
that um, negotiate after you receive an offer. Like once you receive an offer, ask for more. Like, no, no one really feels good about that. Like if the candidate starts to negotiate after the letter is already extended, like let's think about the work that actually had to be done to get all these approvals, to to put that together and so forth. And then the candidate comes back with like, hey, can I have an extra $10,000? Then the manager's like, wait a second, like we tried to put our best foot forward here and you still don't think it's enough. Like, you know, like now they're kind of like rethinking, like if they made a mistake somewhere or like, can they maybe continue to interview, right? And then if the manager comes back and says, no, this is our best offer. Now the candidate feels not so great because they're like, really? Like you couldn't give me 10 extra thousand dollars? Like, I'm going to work so hard for you and so forth, right? So don't negotiate after, like negotiate up front or ask better questions up front before that letter is in your hand. So what's something that's worked for me is doing that soft close. And I also uh, explain the process to the candidate of like how the approval process works. Like, hey, I'm going to have to get approval from the chief HR officer, from the CEO. We're going to have this committee where we have to all agree and so forth. Uh, And then I have to put together eight pages uh, of an offer letter together. So let me walk you through it now, because I don't want to, and I kind of talk about like, think about it being like, uh, you're, you're going down the aisle of getting married and I'm sitting there with this like letter in hand, and then you just don't show up. Like, I just told you what I had to go through. Please don't do that to me. So what ends up happening at that point, that's where the negotiate, like I open a door for any sort of negotiations, for any questions, for anything that may occur. And I say like, look, once the offer is extended to you, please know how much effort it took and we are putting our best foot forward. So if that doesn't work for you, or I totally get it, but I just want you to know that we, how much effort that it takes. What ends up happening is that not only do I not get any sort of like rejection of my offer, like usually the rejection comes before I spend that time because they appreciate it. Like, look, like I get all the steps that you're going through. Just FYI, I have this other offer in hand. So, you know, if that's the offer, I'm going to reject it. Okay, great. Well, then I don't have to like go through this efforts, right? So I hardly ever get rejections of my offer letters and they respect that human connection of like, look like you understand what I have to go through. I have to go talk to my family. I have to think about everything that goes into switching a job and they respect the efforts on my side as well. Last thing, I want to leave listeners with some some action items around like when they have to decline or reject a candidate so they make an offer somebody accepts it and now they got to go tell everybody else that they interviewed that sorry you didn't get the job you've got a lot of good stuff in your book about like templates and things like that uh, scripts that people can use but in your mind what's the right approach to make sure that they're leaving the rejection in a positive experience and you know I'm a huge proponent of the employer brand and I think this is a, a key component to that it's like Every rejection, you can leave them with some sort of positive experience where they may come back around, they may talk positively about you. And I think this is the opportunity to do that. So uh, in your mind, what's the best way, the best approach for people to take? I mean, the the best approach, right, is to treat them how you would want to be treated. So if you invested your time to interview and you get a canned rejection letter of like, sorry, we move forward with someone who has better skills that match our job better. Would you want that, right? Like you would want some sort of feedback and and worse off, like not hearing anything at all and getting ghosted as a candidate. Like, would you ever want that? Like if you are a candidate, if you don't, then don't do it to, to other people, right? So most of the time, like no one wakes up and says like, I can't wait to go interview so badly at this job that they ghost me. Like everyone wakes up and says, I'm going to do my best. Right. And so ultimately they realize that they're going to get, not everyone is going to get the job. And most of the time they're probably interviewing at more than one job, just like you're probably interviewing more than one candidate. Okay. So rejection is inevitable at some capacity, but do it with care and do it with kindness of like, 
responding to their thank you emails of like, you know, yes, it was really great to meet you as well. I hope we stay in contact. And in fact, let's put something in the book. So, you know, three, four months out, let's grab coffee. Like small things like that go a long way. And like you said, like employer branding, that's going to show up there. And that's going to show up with positive candidate experience where even if they get rejected, they'll still talk nicely about the company and be a brand ambassador. In fact, some of the best hires that I've made were referrals from individuals who were rejected. My guest today has been Tatiana Cure. Her book is Hire to Win, Manager's Practical Guide for Attracting and Interviewing Top Talent. Go check out this book. There's so much we didn't even cover on this. And there's lots of great templates and lists and advice in here that it's truly a guide for for hiring managers and uh, leaders. So go check it out. Tatiana, where can people learn more about you? Or feel free to mention anything that would be helpful for listeners. Yeah, so you can get the book on Amazon. There's a paperback. There's an audio book as well. Um, You can also check out some of those templates that you can download on howtowintalent.com and connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm always posting opinions uh, on there as well. So connect with me with Tatiana Cure on LinkedIn. Tatiana, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for coming on. Thank you so much for having me, Brendan. 